Today I'm gonna to do a little bit of an update tour of our building, just to kind of show you where we're at with things and all the cool things that are happening here at BHB. We still have tons of cute little baby snakes, just like this pastel pink albino western hognose snake. Now there's really two types of albinos when it comes to hognose snakes, and that would be the normal red albino and the pastel pink albino. They're both albinos, but they look slightly different. Obviously the pastel pink is a much more pink animal with a little bit of green hues coming through with it. Now interestingly enough when you breed the two albinos which are both recessive they are not compatible. So breeding a pastel pink albino to a normal red albino will actually net you normal looking babies which is a little unusual. Of course there's some other types of sort of albinos like the lavenders but they're not really quite albinos and then of course there's things like the toffees and caramels that are really almost a little bit more like a T positive albino. Regardless hognos are absolutely beautiful and I'm going to show you kind of an update of where we're at. Colubrids are in hibernation, geckos are in hibernation, but they're coming up pretty soon. So I hope you guys are going to enjoy this tour update. What do you say we take a look in the back room? Of course, this would be my colubrid room slash gecko room. And when these are fully operational, which of course all these empty racks here are full of colubrids in about a week and a half, we can hold 800 adult corn snakes, king snakes, and milk snakes, and 28 quart Rubbermaids. And of course, this side are baby snakes. Some are still here, some are of course sold, and we will be ramping up for new production here coming up pretty soon. And again, colubrids are gonna be coming up in about a week and a half, so I'll be really Really excited to do a Snake Bites episode about bringing colubrids out of hibernation and taking you guys through the early steps of the colubrid breeding season. That also brings me to the fact that geckos are in hibernation. So let's go ahead and take a look at the gecko section. We keep the majority of our leopard geckos in 28 quarts. We keep them in groups of four females and then we rotate a male through, typically having a male in at least once every four or five days during that breeding group. And again, they're in hibernation now, but they'll be coming up within about a week and a half and then the process starts. Now what you want to do is you want to slowly warm them up for maybe about a week, start offering them food and give them about a week, week and a half of warming up and eating before you start introducing males. Regardless, these all here are actually shoebox racks that are keeping individual geckos in them until their adulthood. These are either for sale or they're gonna be future breeders. I wanna show you a couple really quick that are absolutely incredible. Of course, this would be a snow, white, and yellow. Now the max snow is a co-dominant and the white and yellow is also a co-dominant mutation, or really a incomplete dominant because there's really not a super white and yellow. Regardless, that combination is absolutely gorgeous. Another one that I really love would happen to be just the bold snows. Again, the max snow, and then the polygenic trait that would be the bold snow, which is just basically the striping down its back. Now that is a gorgeous gecko, and they're extremely polymorphic. They can go from a very little amount of yellow to them, to quite a bit of yellow, to a complete stripe, to just kind of broken up patterning. Regardless, they are unbelievably beautiful. This is another one. This would happen to be a bold snow, just like I showed you. Then also the combination of white and yellow. So again, this is a bold, snow, white, and yellow. The max snow being co-dominant, the white and yellow being incomplete dominant, and this bold part, that striping part, of course, being a polygenic line bred trait. Sticking with the snow project, this would happen to be a super snow, white and yellow. And you can just see the super snow is the super version of the co-dominant max snow. And it comes out with that crazy, beautiful lines like this. And then the white and yellow just really brightens it up and cleans it up. But again, you don't get a lot of that yellow influence because the snow is lacking the majority of the yellow most of the time. Although we certainly are getting lower on the colubrid baby snakes, which would be corns, kings, milks, and rat snakes. We still have several hundred really cool animals available, like this coral ghost corn snake. Now we work with this pink line of corn snake that is called coral or salmon, and basically it is just a polygenic increase amount of pink 
snakes. So every generation you keep back the pinkest ones and you breed them and every generation they get a little more and more pink. The two lines that we really work with are Ghost and Snows. Although we do have a few other lines that we're starting to work on, we're still in the early stages and it takes generations to really make an impact. So we haven't really seen the fruits of our labor yet, but trust me, it's coming. Another really cool corn snake that I absolutely love would of course be the Tessera corn snakes, which is that pattern mutation just like this. And this is actually a co-dominant mutation, which is really awesome. That means that you could breed something like this to a normal and you're gonna get this pattern mutation right off the bat. You don't have to breed it and get normal heterozygous animals and raise them up and breed them back right off the rip. You're gonna get this beautiful color. And of course, this would be a amelanistic or what we refer to as albino, which is lacking the black pigment and a recessive mutation. Another Tessera corn that we have that's absolutely gorgeous, and again, it's another recessive mutation, would be the aneurythristic or black corn Tesseras. I think these are one of my favorite of all the Tesseras, to be honest with you. There's just something about that black and gray color with that really cool pattern that really just does it for me. I think these things are absolutely gorgeous. And I tell you what, one of the most gorgeous corn snakes, to me anyways, would be the scaleless corn snakes. And that's right, that's these little monkeys right here. They are absolutely breathtaking. Now, scaleless corn snakes originated over in Europe, and they are a recessive mutation. Now, to be honest with you, the original corn snakes that came in were actually hybridized between an emery rat snake and a corn snake. But some people might think, is there a chance they could be related to the Texas rat snakes? And actually, from a timeline standpoint, for, so chronologically, they can't be related because when the Texas rat snakes were first available, there wouldn't have been enough time to breed them to corn snakes, breed them back, and then do that two or three generations to get what basically looks like an emery crossed with a corn snake. So they are different than the scaleless Texas rats. Although I am curious, much like a lot of the albinos can cross over, let's say an albino corn snake bred to an albino cow king, oftentimes you will actually get albino hybrids there's a good chance that the scaleless gene with corn snakes would also be compatible with the scaleless gene of the rat snakes. That being said, they are definitely not the same mutation, but they are originally 50% emery rat and 50% corn snake, which are basically kind of relatives. Regardless, over the generations, they've been bred more and more into corn, so most of them are 7 8 corn or more. But there's a lot of polymorphism in as well. Look at the difference between that scaleless corn snake and this scaleless corn snake. That's the same exact mutation. So if you hatch out four or five scaleless corn snakes, oftentimes each one of them looks completely different. Moving downstairs, we have our pythons and boas. Now, boa constrictors typically are fall breeders, so they'll breed anywhere from September, usually through December or so. But when it comes to rainbow boas, they are typically spring breeders. So we start to cool them down around October, November. They're kind of slightly cooled down from maybe from an 82 degree ambient high temperature of the day down to about 76 degrees at night. Now, we'll keep them cool for two and a half to three months at that way. We'll continue to feed them, but slightly smaller meals than normal. Once it gets to about February, we up the temperatures back up to 82 to 84 during the day with a small nighttime drop, but nothing too dramatic. And then we start introducing males and females. With other pythons, we actually breed during the cool down. As I mentioned before, we actually breed our pythons during the cool season. So right around mid-November, we drop our temperatures from that 82 to 84 degree ambient down to about 76 degrees at night. We also drop our hot spot is typically about 95 or 96. We'll drop that in the evening for about eight hours down to about 86 or 87 degrees. Not really going much higher than 92 degrees even on the hot spot during the cool down season. This is when the pythons will actually start copulation. They copulate for probably about two and a half months before we slightly start to warm it up, but we always check follicular growth to decide when that warm up is. Once we have females that have 18 to 20 millimeters, we know it's time to slowly start to raise the temperature. Once we start doing that, we saw increased follicle growth anywhere from 20 to 30 to 35 millimeters within a rapid amount of time. That's when you're gonna get an ovulation and eventually we're gonna start to see full grown pregnant snakes. That's exactly where we're at right now. 
And this happens to be one of our first ovulations of the season, this beautiful blue-eyed leucistic ball python. Now this happens to be a super lesser, and she's actually been bred to a pastel GHI. Now the GHI and lesser and Mojave genes mix extremely well, so these guys will be 100% lesser and 50% GHI, with of course half of them also being pastel. Because the super lesser, everything that this animal produces will come out lesser, which really increases my odds to produce those pastel lesser GHIs. And of course, I couldn't be more excited about our potential in blue tongue skinks this year. We finally have a nice group of beautiful animals up to size, from Turner White to sunrises to sunsets to blaze to all kinds, even hypo easterns and banded easterns, not to mention some Indonesian blue tongue skinks that we're really excited about too. I tell you what, with any luck, we're gonna have a bunch of really beautiful babies. We're a little bit behind schedule this year compared to most people because we kept things cooled down, and we cooled them down to the low 70s and upper 60s for about two months. They've just come out of hibernation, they're starting to shed now, and we're starting to see copulation. Now these are a live bearing animal, so in a couple months, we're gonna hopefully see some fresh little babies. We are so excited. And lastly, we have our baby ball python isle. Again, just like with the adult cluberts, it's getting a little bit less animals, but the truth is we still have some amazing snakes. Let me just show you a couple of them. Take a look at this one right here. This is actually a ghost crystal ball python. So the ghost gene is a recessive mutation, which is called either ghost or hypo, and of course the crystal would be what they call a special in a Mojave. They're an allelic animal, so when you breed a special to a Mojave, you get the crystal bee, and of course the recessive mutation is the ghost. But that is just one gorgeous snake. Next up would be a lesser bee GHI. Now I spoke earlier how that lesser in the GHI gene just really make for some beautiful offspring. Well this happens to have the spider gene in it as well. And this is one of my favorite snakes that I had this year. What a gorgeous animal. Next up would be the Sterling Lesser Orange Dream. The Orange Dream is a co-dominant mutation that really brightens things up as well as cleans it and brings a ton of really beautiful orange and you can start to see it just kind of pouring through here. And of course, the Sterling Lesser part would be a Super Pastel Cinnamon Lesser. That is just a gorgeous snake. And then one of the most beautiful animals that we had this year would be these pastel highways. Now the highway is an allelic animal, just like I spoke earlier about when the crystal ball python. This would happen to be something that would call a gravel to a yellow belly. So it's in the super stripe complex. Again, the gravel and the yellow belly combined make the highway, and of course, this is a pastel. So guys, that's basically it. The state of the union of BHP. We're excited for the breeding season, not only with snakes, but also the geckos and the blue tongue skinks. Things are about to heat up and get really exciting around here, and I can't wait to share with you our successes and our triumphs and all of the ins and outs of what we do to go about to be a successful breeding season. I will continue to share tips so that hopefully you can have successes in whatever you guys decide to breed. And as always, guys, I'm Facebook and tweeting and Instagram and my way through things, so make sure to follow me over at Snake Bites TV. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites.